Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. We'd like to thank Capital One, our sponsor for the podcast from OSCON in Austin, Texas. Learn more about Capital One's developer program at developer.capitalone.com. Hey, it's Alex Williams, the new stack here live from OSCON in Austin, Texas. And lucky to have with me two people who know community management very well, uh, Jared Smith of Capital One and John O'Bacon, who has his own consulting organization currently and is helping companies with developing their own open source culture. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, glad to be here. Yeah. And so I'm really curious about, uh, you know, from your perspective, Jared, what is the philosophy that Capital One has about developing you know, this community around open source culture? You've, been, you've done it for now s several years, and curious where you are in that maturity stage right now, how you might uh, compare it to years past. Sure, so uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a couple of different pieces when we talk about you know, open source community. I think there's trying to build up open source communities around the open source projects that we sponsor and that we've launched from Capital One. But then there's also kind of building up the, the, the open source culture within Capital One, within our development organization. And, and to speak of, to, to both of those, you know, we've, we've been launching open source projects for about two years now. Our first project was one called Hygieia that we launched here at OzCon two years ago. Um, and so that's that's been an interesting journey for Capital One to understand what it is not not just to use open open source or, or or participate in open source communities, but actually launch an open source project, build a community around that, um, take in contributions from other from other developers, other organizations. How to make sure that even though we're the sponsor of that project, we're not the only one you know, working on that project or putting code into that project or fixing bugs in that project, but really building a true open source community around around those projects. Um, to speak to the kind of the inside culture of, of open source at, at Capital One, we're also on a, you know, a, a similar journey there. I think you know, we're, we're in, a, in a slightly different uh, you know, industry where it's kind of high, highly regulated and there's kind of the old way of doing things and, and, and we're trying to in some ways break out of that mold um, and, and you know, adopt open source wholeheartedly inside of, inside of the organization, be an open source first organization, and then to try to teach developers inside Capital One who may not have a lot of experience in, in open source community. They may have used open source, but not necessarily understand the community aspects of that. Helping them learn that culture, learn kind of the, the best practices around how to participate in an open, open source environment, um, some of those skills and, and, and methodologies that work well in open source communities. How do you view like, the, you know, the developers kind of in this whole, you know, in this whole story? We often hear about developer cultures, but I'm curious about it from like, you know, how how you know how do you approach that? Because I mean they they right. may they're they're not just all going to be the same. No, <laughs> I'm a big believer that 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 part of the workflow component is is having a strong baseline that is compatible with the rest of what the organization is doing, that is flexible enough that that people that people can make it their own. Because I think when you force people into a box, when you remove autonomy from the from the equation, you get a this rigid culture that no one likes to work in. Um, the tricky thing I think with this, but to me where the really interesting work lies is that I think to build that culture effectively you need top down, a top down permissive environment. Like a lot of the companies I work with. A top down what environment? Permissive environment. Okay, right. So a lot of the companies I work with, for example, will have a, a CEO or a CIO will, will say, you know, I see the value in, in collaboration and community or open source or inner source or whatever you call it. Um, they, they identify the value, they want to bring it into their organization, and that you need that permissive component, because I think particularly in large orgs, like in small startups, it's a much more fluid environment. It's arguably a little too fluid in some. But in large organizations, I think the, the challenge is not, um, invariably it's not at the developer level, like a lot of developers live and breathe open source and they want to work in an open source environment, and even if they don't live and breathe open source, they enjoy collaborating with other developers. And the tricky thing is not necessarily that upper level, because 
a lot of those folks see the value. The tricky bit is the middle management layer. And that's where I think, that's where I think we need to um, build effective workflow and then consistently like start small and then iterate and iterate and iterate in this methodology as it grows throughout the company. That's really interesting. We li I'd like to get back to that middle manager uh, yep. part of this part of uh, this whole story. I'm curious about what you you know what Jono was saying uh, about uh, Jared about uh, workflows and establishing that base and you know what workflows have you established and and what what base you know have you formed and what are you trying to do you know with that now so uh, to go back to one of the things Jono said about uh, about autonomy I think autonomy is important and we've tried to give our development teams you know as much autonomy as we can without with with still keeping in some certain guardrails <laughs> cer certainly for regulatory reasons and just for, for sanity <coughs> reasons as well um, you know we're, we're big believers in the agile methodologies and and, and we want small nimble teams to be able to build build the tools and, 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 and build their product the way they want to, using the tools they want to within a certain set of, of, of guidelines. And so that's that's proved very effective. Um, we found that, that developers love autonomy, developers love mastery, and developers love being part of something that's bigger than themselves. So how do you do autonomy with constraints, I guess? That's my question. It's, uh, it's interesting. I think part of that is helping people see the value of not just here's how you do this, but here's why you do this. Um, taking a step back and helping them understand, you know, if they understand the why, then then the how often becomes trivial to yeah. to, to, to get them to, to get on board with. It's, it's helping them understand the the wh why. Why are we doing that this way? Why you know why do we have these guardrails here? Why you know why is it a good idea to do this? Maybe not such a good idea to do that. I think when people understand the why. It, it, is that lots of meetings that you have, or what do you do? Sometimes it's meetings, sometimes it's it's coaching, sometimes it's just part of the company culture. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, I've, the word I've, spreads. I found that, that if you have a, you know, especially in, in like, like Jono said, in middle management, if you've got middle managers <laughs> who understand the why, they pass that down onto their teams, yep. and they, they, they kind of, in some ways, project those, those same values down onto their teams. Um, where, where you have middle management that doesn't understand that, then there's the friction because, you know, the developers understand it and, and they see that the, the, you know, the top level management espouses those same values and then they're, they're saying, well, my, my, my manager doesn't seem to get this, but, you know, the, the rest of the company seems to do it and then, and then, then there's some friction. So there. what is the hard part then with middle management? I, I think part of it is, uh, one of the things in my mind that's quite interesting about this work is that there's, there's a lot of psychological underpinnings behind this. There's a lot of behavioral economics, you know, that, that drive a lot of this kind of stuff. And one element I think is that, um, you know, in a company when we're trying to do new things, trying to build out new initiatives or something like that, you'll often get pushback. And I think it's, you'll, the pushback will either be because of an individual or because, because of a, a person's domain, you know, like, Someone runs a certain team and they don't want this, this work to influence their team in a certain way or there's a whole set of considerations that are the reason why, why they're pushing against it. And there may of course be, you know, I just think that this is the wrong way of working. The tricky thing I think here is, I think when, when some people face these kinds of challenges, um, one approach that people take is to basically persist and persist and persist until that person gives in. And what happens with middle management I think is, um, they understand the top-down directive from the from the execs, um, but they, it's going to require managing and operating their team in a slightly different way. And the tricky thing about that is, um, I think particularly for larger larger organizations, and depending on the type of organization, like I've seen this in some financial services companies, there are outside influences that will that will restrict people doing that. There will be, for example, people who think, well, I don't want that person to get my bonus because they're getting more respect and they're getting more recognition because of this open environment this this collaborative culture mm. so you get these kinds of these these kinds of elements that are in play to me the solution to this in my mind is to really understand the drivers behind each of these different people each of these different layers um, because then I think when we understand them we can tune that to them so for example if you if I'll give you a tiny example one company that I was working with um, a little while ago there was a, a middle manager who was very, very, um, he pushed back a lot about pushing material out to the organization. We were pu publishing like reports every week and having different ways of, of, of socializing this work so people could gradually know about it and they could participate. And he pushed back actively. And when I sat down and talked to him, one of the things we discovered was that 
he was just, was just worried about his team looking bad. So I took a little bit of time to basically help to um, map out his team's work in that report in a way that he felt pretty happy with. And then before, you know, within a couple of weeks, he was all about it because his team now looked great. He just, he hadn't internalized that, that this, this change could actually reflect well on, on the work that he was doing. Mm. And that's why I think that personal piece is that, the thing I've learned is that often when people, this is gonna sound horribly arrogant, it's not meant to. I think when people, what a lot of people say they want and what they actually want are two quite different things. Right. And I think when people say they don't want something, what they actually don't want are two quite different things as well. And that's where the tricky cultural piece, I'm sure you've seen a load of this at Capital One, as every other company has. So. I think uh, one other thing I might add is that um, you know some some middle managers were hired to deliver a product to the business, you know, or for the business, yeah. and so they see this extra you know open source work or you know contributing back patches back upstream. They seem to see those as extra non-functional requirements. That hey, this is extra work I have to do. It's just a tax on right. on what I'm doing. And if they don't catch the vision of well, why are we doing this? Why is it important to, to work with upstream communities? Why is it important to to, to you know push push your patches back upstream? If they don't catch that vision of why? Then they just see this as a tax on on the, on the work that they're really yeah. being, you know, they're, that they're being tasked with, and that they're they're being rewarded for for accomplishing. You know, yeah. oftentimes the middle managers are hired to, hey, your performance is based on did you deliver this product? Did you deliver this this value to the business? And they they, they it's it's easy for them to fall into the trap of seeing this as a, as an ad, added burden or an ad, added tax on what they're trying to do. Um, and so helping them see that you know understand the the reasons why that's important, and it's not just a tax on what they're doing, makes all the difference in the world. How much of that then requires you to help them understand open source culture and, and how open source technologies are developed? It, it varies from team to team and manager to manager. Some, some understand it as, at, a, you know, at, at a logical level, but maybe don't catch the passion for it. Others don't un understand it. Um, so there, you know, there's always just, education yeah. that, that needs to go on. Right. So. Uh, Johnny, you were saying something about you know what people want and actually want, and what they don't want, and what what, and what they what they don't want, but versus really with the reality of you yeah. know, what what that is, right? So, can you uh, um, extrapolate on that or put examples of that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the areas where we often see this is with executive stakeholder requirements. You know, so one of the things I'm sure we've all seen this. You know, in your work, Alex, and you, Jared, like as you get to know lots of different companies, there's these consistent personality types that tend to prevail. Um, different people, but a lot of common personality patterns. Um, a good example of this is founders. Founders, of, particularly of startups, who are often have amazing vision, but tactically, um, not particularly great. You know, They need a team wrapped around them to convert their vision into something that people can work from. Um, and a good example there is like a lot of founders that I've met and worked with, You know what they, what they say they want in a particular initiative when we're talking at like a, a more specific strategic or tactical level um, might be very different from the reality of what I think they want to deliver. So for example, it may be, you know, I want, you know, I want everybody use it. I want everybody developing and participating in my open source project. And that might be the stated goal. Mm. But what might be the underlying goal here really is we want our company to have real kind of brand recognition and respect in this demographic of people. You mm, know? Okay. And I think it's sometimes it's just good to try and tease out those. Obviously, this varies in, in people. Right. Um, I think this is the tricky thing with the cultural work is is it's that connective tissue between people and all the all the variables that are wrapped up in people with dreams and desires and, and fe fears and all that kind of stuff with the day-to-day -day practicalities of workflow and process and, and all that kind of stuff. So that those dreams and desires, those, those you know, that, 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 that magic is right. really kind of what the founders and the, right. and the visionaries really, that's, that's what they feel yep. and really want. But then it's a matter of like, all right, how are we actually going to you know, how we could execute upon this, how, really. How do you translate it, that into day-to-day -day exactly. tasks that need to be accomplished and, right. and, and people can... can and that, I think that's the difficult because that's the difficulty is that, you know, you bring in some consultant. This is the kind of consultant I absolutely never want to become is you get some consultants who come and they talk a lot about the, you know, the people elements of things and then they write a big report, but it doesn't translate into day-to-day -day practical stuff that yeah. actually moves the needle. And that's right. why I'm a big believer in, and I've seen other companies do this, and I'm sure Capital One do this as well, is 
as you transition to this culture is breaking it down into little pieces yeah. and iterating on it because it's right. not something you can say we will do this in 2017 and it will succeed it's we should try these things and see what works well to this company because I'm sure that Capital One and the way PayPal have done inner source and the way other companies are doing it will be very different right? yes yeah it reminds me of uh, you know of, of how uh, processes get ingrained inside right. organizations and you know, and so it might start with, uh, oh, we're going to do this great new project and it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And then you do it and then like suddenly things start to fall, you know, things start to get missed. There's gaps. There's, right. And then suddenly then it's like, maybe we need a project manager, you know, to help with this. Right. <laughs> you know, maybe we need to kind of start like, you know, kind of charting this out and understanding this. And it, is that part of it? I mean, do you start seeing that kind of like that underlying kind of infrastructure start to emerge when you start working on it in this iterative manner? And, and how so? Uh, at, least I yeah. would, at least I would say one of the, uh, I think, interesting questions, in, and of course this varies from company to company, is I think there's becoming a, a, a trend in recent years of trying to build processes or methodologies that are really designed to deal with crappy people. So I'll give you an example. Within Agile, you've got things like story points and epics and things like that. And I think that overcomplicates the things, you know. I think that's really there to really deal with kind of crappy product managers who don't really know what they're doing. So to me, the tricky thing here is, is it's like identifying um, how do we apply just the right amount of methodology for people to be effective and collaborative with each other without forcing people into a, into a workflow that um, ultimately will, will, will deliver average results. There's, there was, I was reading a few weeks ago that, you know, like there's Moore's Law, there's Godwin's Law, that kind of thing. There is another law, I forget the name of it, which was from a guy who um, worked in a TV uh, factory and would basically pull out enough components in the television until it stopped working. And that reduced the cost and then made loads more money. And I think we should take the same approach to how we build these, these open source cultures is what's the most lightweight way, way of doing things? And when you get things like epics and story points and these things, I think it's way too heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Because then what you're doing is you're, you're, you're trying to convert, <clears throat> you're trying to use methodology as a way of, of, of having people deliver good results. And sometimes you've just got to depend on good people doing good work, I think. Right. So. Oh, yeah. That's curi I'm curious, yeah. yeah, yeah. It comes, comes, comes down to, you've got to get to the point where you trust your people, and autonomy and mastery you know, come into that, and, and giving them, let, letting them choose their tool chain, letting them choose the way in which they're going to perform, but setting expectations of this is how we're going to measure your results. It's not about what tool chain you used or what, you know, right. what development methodology you used or, or what, uh, you know. You so know. how do you help measure results? Um, it, it, it's, it's about delivering you know, value. It's 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 you know. Does, does, does your team help the overall organization accomplish its its mission and and its goals? And it's not about how you do that. It's about you know setting expectations up front. This is how we're going to measure you in this particular aspect. And did you do, did you deliver? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some teams that's easier to measure than others. I mean, you know, not every not every team is delivering you know mission critical software. Some you know some teams are are are. are, are you know, just keeping systems up and running. Some teams are, you know, developing developing tools that are used in little niche areas. I mean, it's it's it it, it really goes all over the map. And so you're two years in. Tell us the open source projects now that you're managing. So uh, we've got a number of open source projects that we've launched from Capital One. I think we've launched about a dozen or okay. so. Okay. Um, we've got kind of three marquee. Um, projects that, that we're highlighting here at OzCon. Right. Um, our first one that I talked about earlier was a Hygieia. It's a right. DevOps dashboard. Right. Just a, a nice visualization of how are things in my build and, and test environments, you know, are, are commits happening? How many times are they happening per day? How many builds are happening per day? Are those going into a dev environment? Are those going into a QA environment? Maybe a performance testing or production environment? What does that, that build pipeline look like? How long is it taking for, for for commits and builds to, to make it, make their way through the pipeline. So just a nice, easy visualization um, of, of kind of, is, is my build process working or not? Um, so we, when you're, so you're, you have these projects um, and you're two years in and you're going to be managing these projects for some <coughs> foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the goals that you have for the next year, for, to, you know, to 
uh, you know, as your as your culture kind of uh, evolves. Well, obviously, for any of these projects, for Hygieia or other or other open source projects, we want them to to be true open source projects. We want to see outside collaborators. We want to see as many outside people with commit rights as possible because that that shows that it's a nice, healthy ecosystem. That we're not the only ones, you know. That, that have skin in the game, so to speak, as far as the future of these projects, but we've got outside collaborators. So on, on Hygieia, for example, we've got many other large organizations, whether it's Walmart or Verizon right. or other co companies, not only using um, Hygieia, but act actively contributing back to it, actively getting commit rights into the, you know, to, to, to con contribute directly to the project. And then, it, then the project isn't just about Capital One, it's really about the community. So That's John, yeah, interesting. So, so sorry to interrupt, to John O, so, where do you see, like, you know, like, your companies like Capital One are two years in, uh, you're seeing companies, I'm sure, that are kind of in similar stages and stuff. Where, where are you you're starting to see kind of like where, like, companies are coming to you saying, hey, we need a tune-up, you know? Right. We, you know, we've gotten this far, but, you know, we need some more coaching, you know? And, and what are the kind of things that they're needing? Yeah, <clears throat> it, it's interesting, I mean, I think there's a few areas that, I, that I've seen personally, I'm sure there's way more areas than this that other people have seen. Um, I think one element is where, um, you know, particularly with, I think startups face this where there is a sense of we need to pivot in a certain direction. You know, we're, we're not seeing the results that we're seeing in this area. One of the challenges here I, I think that companies have seen is that community management and leadership is a very young art and science. And um, a lot of people who work in it, I think are a lot more tactical than strategic. So. Uh, I run the Community Leadership Summit every year, which runs, which happens before OSCON, and we see this every year. A lot of people come to the to the event, a lot of people very new, they're at the beginning of their careers. So a lot of the work that people talk about there are things like blogging and social media and things like that, which to me are a component of, yeah. of a strategy. To me, the, what a community manager um, should be doing is looking at the overall experience of how can that person be successful? You know, how does, from the minute they learn about a particular product, uh, uh, project, how what's the onboarding? How do they transition from new to regular to core developers, uh, uh, contributors? How do they, what are the incentives that are laid underneath that? How do you promote that? How do you connect that to other pipelines and companies and things like that? And I think what happens is companies, they invest in community um, and they see those tactical pieces like the blogging and social media. And then like, we want to see some, we want to take this to the next level. We want to build something that's a bit more mature. And, and there's going to gain a great level of retention. We're definitely seeing, I think, companies like bigger companies who are seeing just these trends that are happening. You know, I'm sure this was the case with Capital One. You know, where they see collaboration, they see examples of community um, participation, and like we, we want that, but we have no idea where to begin and how we and how we get started on that as well. Mm -hmm. If I can interject yeah. here for a second, I see the same thing. I have companies come to me, probably at least once a week, saying, "Hey." We know we need a, a, some community leadership, whether that's right. a community manager or, 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 or some other role, but we, need, we know we need community leadership. We don't know how to do that. How, how, how can we figure out what it is you do and, and, and how, right. to, how to do that effectively? And I'm sure that plays into your consulting business quite well. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, I, I got asked a question the other day about um, com, um, open source communities and the business drivers behind them. And they, they you know, this, this group was curious about you know, what is motivating these people to do these open source projects? And, you know, and there's business drivers that Capital One has for open source projects. And I'm, and I'm curious about if there's not a real true business driver, it does not necessarily mean that the open source project is, you know, uh, is, is, has a bright or a gloomy future, right? It just, you can't really state that. But I think, that, but there are different degrees, aren't there? There's like, yeah. You know, for like Capital One, there has to be business drivers, right? Sure, sure. There's there's certainly business drivers. They're not necessarily you know immediate financial business drivers, <laughs> which is which is nice. But 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 certainly from a from a helping our developers feel comfortable and use the tools that they that they're comfortable with and, and, and know how to use and want to continue to use and want to continue to contribute to, um, that that plays into it. Obviously, you know, you know. Hiring, hiring is easier when you're when you're working in an open source first organization because a lot of the developers out there are, are these days are growing up using open source. They're very comfortable with open source. They don't want to be in a closed source to, in, environment. Um, but there's also just the benefits of hey, if, if we're using and consuming open source, and we want to you know we want to play good 
good corporate citizen and, and give back to those communities in, in meaningful ways and in, 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 in honest ways and in and, and community ways, then, then part of that is just kind of kind of expected that, you know, if you're using open source, and, and you, you ought to be giving back. That's just kind of the, the implied social contract with open source. I would say that's where I think we're, we're seeing the maturation of the industry as well as, I think, you know, when open source was beginning, um, people who'd been around it for a while, there was like this just gut feeling of this is the right thing to do, and a lot of people couldn't necessarily articulate it. I certainly couldn't. Um, and I think because there's tangible value delivered with software, and then there's the value, with the, the major value in many ways with open source is the intangible value is that, um, you know, your developers are happy in a company. It, it's easier for recruiting because kids who are grown up now are grown up in an, in an open source world. Um, and you mentioned earlier on about metrics, you know, that's, that is, you know, it's the, it's the counting the tangible metrics is, is simple. It's the intangible piece where I think we're starting to see <coughs> muscle developing across the industry. Mm. And I so. guess one <coughs> interesting thing, I had a discussion just the other day here at OzCon with somebody that talked about how you know the, the financials of companies being able to to either write off or, or you know you know you know, make financial statements about the goodwill of their organization, you know? Right. Well, what's, the, what's the intangible value of that goodwill? And I, I don't pretend to understand all the economics of it, but right. there is something there just about building goodwill in the community because you're doing the right thing and all you've right. proven that you... You're... Well, good. Well, thank you guys for uh, you you. taking some time. Jono and Jared, appreciate it. No problem. Uh, Jono Bacon he has his own consulting company. What's the actual name of the consulting company? Is it? It's 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 it's, uh, it's a complicated one. It's John O'Bacon Consulting. Oh, John O'Bacon, <laughs> John O'Bacon Consulting, John O'Bacon Consulting. Yeah. Okay, I think yeah. I remember that. And Jared Clues, Smith. Closing the question right there. <laughs> <laughs> and Jared Jared Smith of Capital One. Thank you both for joining. Thank us. you. Thank you. We'd like to thank Capital One, our sponsor for the podcast from OSCON in Austin, Texas. Learn more about Capital One's developer program at developer.capitalone.com. Listen to more episodes of the New Stack Bakers at thenewstack.io slash podcast. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening and see you next time.